Elizabeth and Philip take their places on history's pages. To the stirring strains of Mendelssohn, they march as man and wife toward the west door amidst nearly 3,000 invited spectators. This November, November 20th, marks the 70th wedding anniversary of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. That's their platinum wedding anniversary, which is really a remarkable um, milestone. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip are a royal romance of all time, and readers are just fascinated by their love story from the very beginning when they first met to their royal wedding and to watching their family grow. Hi, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Take thee, Philip. Take thee, Philip. And thanks to the immense popularity of the crown, you know, there's really this renewed interest in their love story and how everything began between Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. What else am I supposed to do? Sit around and wait for you while you're queening? Queening? Yes, queening. The crown was fantastic. It really brought to life British history in a way that no um, program had ever done before. The second season of The Crown returns December 8th, so the excitement is really there for the second season, and also to know the real story behind it. So with Elizabeth and Philip's 70th anniversary and the second season premiere of The Crown, we thought what better time to celebrate their enduring romance and really incredible love story. I have seen firsthand what it is like for a royal family to be overthrown because they're out of step with the people. I left Greece in an orange crate. My father would have been killed. My grandfather was. I'm just trying to protect you. The future Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, was born in 1921 in Corfu, Greece. The newborn noble was nephew to the reigning Greek king, Constantine I. Philip is a royal in his own right, um, well before he ever met and fell in love with Elizabeth. He is actually from the Danish royal family, Danish by birth. His grandfather became a Greek king in the 19th century. Prince Philip's ancestral background is a little confusing, like many European royals of that time. His grandfather was a Danish prince who was installed into the Greek throne in the late 19th century. So Philip has Danish blood, but he's Greek-born. Philip was actually forced to leave Greece when he was one years old. Philip left his homeland of Greece under pretty um, terrible circumstances. There was a military coup. His uncle, King Constantine, was ousted as the uh, monarch. And Philip ended up having to be smuggled out of the country in an orange crate. He was forced to uh, go and live with relatives in Britain. Philip received a very um, prestigious um, British education. He went to private boarding schools at Cheam and Gordeston. He joined the Royal Navy at 18, and he was actually the top cadet in his class, which was impressive. Um, he was under the tutelage of his very close uncle, Dickie Mountbatten. Philip's real father lived in Monte Carlo and died when Philip was in his early 20s. Because Prince Philip didn't really grow up around his father, Lord Mountbatten became a really important father figure in his life. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer one of those, someone with a grand title, rather than a homeless Charlie Crown? No. Oh. In The Crown, Philip is portrayed by Matt Smith. The 35-year-old actor is best known for playing the title role in the hit BBC series Doctor Who. Well then, no time to lose. I'm the Doctor. Do everything I tell you, don't ask stupid questions, and don't wander off. When I first found out that uh, Matt Smith was playing Philip, I found it quite strange and I was scratching my head because you always imagine Philip as he is now, as an older gentleman, and Matt Smith is quite a hot actor. And then when you saw him on screen and he played such a sizzling portrayal of him, and you look back at the photos of Philip when he was younger, and he was a very, very strikingly handsome man. And Matt really captured his physicality, but also his personality. Try and get some sleep. You too. A naval officer's stag night. Chance would be a fine thing. <laughs> His Majesty has asked to see the two princesses. Right. Come along, girls. Little bit. The future Queen of England was born Elizabeth Windsor on April 21st, 1926. 
Elizabeth's early childhood years were really blissful. So she had her younger sister Margaret as a playmate, and the two of them spent a lot of time in the countryside playing in the fields of heather and down by the babbling brooks. Her family called her Lilibet because that's what she called herself before she could say Elizabeth. So she was Princess Lilibet. She was the niece to the King of England, but she was protected from the expectation of what would lie ahead in her life. So she had a relatively normal childhood. She wasn't expected to become queen. In 1936, everything changed for Elizabeth because her grandfather, George, died and her uncle, Edward, ascended the throne. However, within a year, Edward abdicated. Edward decided to abdicate the throne in order to marry an American woman named Wallace Simpson, who was divorced. That marriage was not going to be permitted within the Church of England, and Edward decided to walk away from the throne in order to marry this woman whom he loved. Elizabeth's father, George, was Edward's younger brother and next in line. The Royal Knight of Arms read the official proclamation from the balcony of Buckingham Palace. Hail to the new King George VI of the British Empire. King George VI ascended the throne in December 1936, making Elizabeth the heir apparent at age 10. The moment her father became king, Elizabeth's education and her life completely changed. She was then having to go to school and to be educated on the British Constitution, on royal monarchy, on royal history, and a lot of expectation and duty of what was going to become of her life. In 1939, the 13-year-old princess visited the Royal Navy College, where she was entertained by a handsome young cadet. Philip's uncle, Dickie Mountbatten, who was also a father figure to him, arranged for Philip to give a tour of the Royal Naval College to Elizabeth and her younger sister, Margaret. I'm sure uh, Dickie Mountbatten, who was known to being very shrewd and intelligent, knew exactly what he was doing when he introduced his very handsome 18-year-old nephew to the future Queen of England. It's really not hard to imagine how Elizabeth may have been swept off her feet by this incredibly dashing, um, you know, future prince in the making. Even if he wasn't an official prince at that time, he had all the trappings of one. So there was a lot of charisma and magnetism around him. Not long after this time, um, Britain went to war and Philip um, went out with the Navy. Elizabeth and her sister Margaret stayed in London and Buckingham Palace throughout the Nazi bombing campaign. While Philip was serving overseas, Elizabeth tracked the Allies' progress with pins on a map in her room. Elizabeth and Philip managed to stay in touch throughout this time. They wrote letters to each other and had photos of each other, um, which they kept with them. Sometimes Elizabeth's letters are auctioned off, and there was one set from that time where she talks about how Philip drives really fast cars, and you can tell how smitten she is with him. Like so many young couples in Britain, the war shaped them and brought them closer together. In The Crown, Elizabeth is played by Claire Foy. The 33-year-old actress received an Emmy nomination for her performance. Claire Foy really did a lot of research to play the role of Elizabeth. And, you know, it's a tough role because Elizabeth is not a superstar in terms of her own kind of charisma. It doesn't feel right as head of state to do nothing. It is exactly right. She's the center of the show, obviously, but she's a very understated woman, and that's a tough one to pull off, and I feel like Claire Foy really taps into the sort of quiet power that the queen projects. But surely doing nothing is no job at all. She really captures that balance of duty and personal struggle and emotion that Elizabeth went through and that Elizabeth is known for. Apparently, there's a large breeding herd of elephants at treetops, so we've got to get there early. Not too early, I hope. Oh, what else have you got in mind for our little holiday? Elizabeth and Philip were first introduced in 1939. By 1943, Elizabeth was the 17-year-old heir to the British throne, while Philip was a 22-year-old decorated officer in the Royal Navy. When Philip was the first lieutenant of HMS Wallace, a warship, 
Um, he made this very shrewd move, which he's credited for in the history books. There was a huge attack going on. And he basically turned off all of the lights on the ship and set out some rafts outside the ship with burning debris to make it look like the ship had been attacked and everyone on the ship was dead. And it meant that the ship actually um, survived the attack and drifted out away from the enemy fire. The surviving soldiers have praised his heroism and his strategy over the years and he um, saved a lot of lives that day. Prince Philip was quite a catch. He was you know, quite tall. He's a very um, imposing gentleman, um, very handsome. And um, in fact, the Queen's bridesmaid, Lady Pamela Hicks, told people at one point that, you know, Philip was every girl's dream Viking prince. That's what he was for Elizabeth. When the romance really sparked for Philip and Elizabeth would have been um, the Christmas of 1943. Philip spent his leave from the armed forces at the palace. He didn't have family to go to at Christmas time. He was invited to Windsor Castle. And this is, I think, when really the romance took off. They had met before, but it was on this occasion that Elizabeth reportedly told her governess that he is the one. He was not intimidated by her, he was fascinated by her, and she was clearly smitten. In March of 1946, the war was now over, and Philip finally returned to London for good. And the place he couldn't stay away from was Buckingham Palace. And of course, the reason was that Elizabeth was there, and he wanted to see her as much as possible, and she wanted to see him. He would spend nights sneaking into Buckingham Palace around the rear entrance in his sports car. It must have been very exciting for Elizabeth and Margaret sneaking in this handsome athletic soldier into the palace where they could have fun. It was kind of like a dorm atmosphere, I'm sure. In June of 1946, on a family trip to Balmoral, which is the royal family's estate in Scotland, it's one of Queen Elizabeth's favorite places in the world, um, Prince Philip finally popped the question to Elizabeth. And without even asking anyone, she accepted his proposal. This was a very subversive moment for Elizabeth. She's the future Queen of England. There's a lot of expectations and there's a lot of implications on who she chooses as her husband. And for her to do this very stridently and very believing in herself and not consulting with anybody shows how much in love Elizabeth was with Philip. This is a time when no matter who you were, um, if, you know, if you're a young woman in that time period, you are going to ask your father's permission. You are going to make sure your family approves. And the fact that Elizabeth did not seek that approval was pretty revolutionary. When Elizabeth told her family that she was engaged to Philip, her father was very pleased with the decision, but they asked them to wait a year to announce this to wait until Elizabeth was 21 because this was seen as a respectable age. That was a big secret to keep because this is someone who is the direct heir to the throne, who has all the world's attention focused on her. There was a lot of media interest. Um, the public appetite to know about her personal life was huge. There were a lot of rumors in the press, but nobody knew for sure. On July 9th, 1947, the palace issued a statement announcing the engagement. That same day, Elizabeth and Philip made their first official appearance together at a royal garden party. There was a lot of reservations about Philip being the husband to the future Queen of England. He was um, a homeless foreigner. For starters, that wouldn't warm to the British public. He had some German connections, and again, this is after the close of World War II. It was still a very tense time between the countries. Several of Philip's sisters married German men. So there were a lot of factors um, working against him, not the least of which was the fact that he was regarded as this sort of, you know, kind of dashing playboy type who may or may not be the most faithful. He also was being backed by Dickie Mountbatten, who was seen as being very subversive and possibly Republican. And so whether Philip was a Trojan horse put in to destroy the monarchy with some theories. The athletic Philip, whose six foot two inch frame had caused many a feminine heart to flutter, had agreed to give up any claim to the Greek throne and dutifully became a British commoner. 
in order to win over th the naysayers. Philip took quite a few steps. Um, he started by renouncing his claim to the Greek throne. He assumed a new surname. He assumed the name of Mountbatten to sound a lot more British. Philip also converted from Greek Orthodox to the Church of England. Publicly, Philip put forth his best face, but privately, he had a lot of reservations about joining the royal family. He knew he was marrying the direct heir to the throne. So with that obviously comes a certain amount of baggage, and for Philip, that would mean being tied down in ways he might not have otherwise wanted to be. You know, he wanted to be a military officer who would be able to travel the world. This is a man who's very alpha male. He's used to getting his own way, used to being in charge of his own life. And entering into the British monarchy, he must have realized that there's going to be a certain element of control of his life that he's going to lose. So why did Philip do it? It must have been that he was incredibly in love with Elizabeth. What else am I supposed to do? Sit around and wait for you while you're queening? Queening? Yes, queening. The crown begins with Elizabeth and Philip's wedding day, which is unfortunate because their courtship was one of the most exciting times of their lives. Maybe I'd like your help with the queen. Oh, in the same flattering way you asked me to redecorate Clarence House. Well, you did that jolly well. I felt like a sissy. But the crown certainly deals with this central dramatic conflict in their relationship, which is power dynamics, which is what makes the show and their marriage so fascinating. They do. They do not hate you. They do. They treat me as an outsider. An irrelevance. Everyone does. It's quite a victory. Eh? There wasn't a single person supported the match. Not a single ally at court or in government. Yet here we all are. Marrying Philip, many historians say, was the great triumph of Elizabeth's life. Elizabeth prevailed over doubters within her own family, within the palace, within the public, within the parliament, who felt that Philip was not a suitable match. It ends up standing as one of her greatest achievements, that she was able to marry the man she loved, and that she was able to cultivate a marriage that has endured through the ages. Elizabeth and Philip were married on November 20th, 1947 at Westminster Abbey. The lavish ceremony was celebrated across the country by a war-weary public. England was still in a pretty major post-war malaise period. It was a, a tough time. They were still rebuilding. Um, so much of the country had been devastated, so many lives lost and they were really looking for a bright spot and a reason to kind of start a new chapter. And certainly their, the, the wedding of Elizabeth and Philip was an opportunity to do that. And that's what the wedding uh, really signified. This was the first time ever that a wedding like this was broadcast to the world and 200 million people tuned in. A half a million people lined the streets in London to get a glimpse of the big day and 2,000 people were invited inside. This included six kings and seven queens. An interesting detail from the wedding day is that Elizabeth's pearl tiara snapped just before she left Buckingham Palace. So there was actually a police escort who, who escorted the um, royal jeweler to fix it. Goes to show even royals have stress on their wedding day. But right before Elizabeth walked down the aisle, the repaired tiara was delivered to her just in time. Elizabeth's very lavish wedding dress was designed by Norman Hartnell, who was a very well-regarded British fashion designer at the time who had worked with the royal family. And he created a fairy tale gown for the then princess. It featured a sweetheart neckline, a full princess ball gown skirt, and 10,000 hand-sewn pearls. One thing that was interesting in the wedding between Elizabeth and Philip was the language. Um, the traditional vows include the word obey, and because she was a future sovereign, the government didn't want to have her obeying anyone um, except for uh, the laws of the land and, and not her husband. To love and cherish and obey. There's a scene in The Crown when the vows are taking place. Obey. She insisted. It was discussed. 
and um, Winston Churchill's wife asks him, obey, really? And he says, yes, she insisted. Elizabeth has always been clear that in addition to being a monarch, or at that time the future monarch, she's a wife and she wanted the traditional vows. It might seem like a small detail now to us, um, but at the time it, it was a big deal to, to keep that word in and to have a future monarch uh, vowing to obey her husband. This nation needs is several years of strong, steady, experienced administration. In The Crown, the role of Winston Churchill is played by John Lithgow. The 71-year-old Oscar-nominated actor won an Emmy for his outstanding performance. On The Crown, we see John Lithgow really um, portray the closeness between Winston Churchill, the then Prime Minister, and the then Princess Elizabeth, soon to be Queen Elizabeth. You missed him. It was really what every British person expected and loved about Churchill, the fiery spirit, the cantankerousness, but the warmth and duty there at the same time. It was a really impeccable job. Uh, there is no problem so complex, no crisis so grave that it cannot be uh, satisfactorily resolved within 20 minutes. So, shall we make a start? where kings and queens have appeared unnumbered times on great occasions, the young couple happily share the supreme day of their lives with their countrymen. For Royals fans, one of the best moments in any royal wedding is the big balcony moment. And that's something we have anticipated, certainly in modern times, for Kate and William's wedding, for Charles and Diana's wedding, but it really all started with Philip and Elizabeth's wedding. Three generations of the royal family now appear. But it is the young bride and groom who really rule England this day. That Buckingham Palace balcony on the mall in London, it's so grand. And um, seeing them walk out in her wedding splendor and her handsome prince, it created a groundswell of joy and excitement and celebration for the people of England and the United Kingdom and really all around the world. It was clear that the whole royal family were really happy in these photographs. You've got the mum who's beaming, you've got the king who's beaming. It really was an amazing celebration. What it signified in that one joyful moment was the dawn of a new era, of um, a new royal family that was putting on display some of the pageantry that in the past maybe had just been kept amongst themselves. It was now shared by the nation and the world. <laughs> You're a bloody idiot. Yeah. After Elizabeth and Philip married, they had this sort of golden honeymoon period. She was not yet queen, she was still Princess Elizabeth. Her husband was serving in the Royal Navy. This is a time where they're living a really normal life, and this is when they start a family. On November 14, 1948, Elizabeth gave birth to Charles, the future Prince of Wales. Her Royal Highness is the proud and happy mother of a prince. The salute is fired, and in the monarch's home lies the infant boy who will one day be king. Philip and Elizabeth were solid and good parents. They were very loving. Um, they were very unsentimental, though. It was a very different time, and they would often leave their children for months on end. By the time of their second anniversary, he was on active duty again in Malta. She left Charles with the governess and the queen mum and joined her husband. The time in Malta really was the time of Elizabeth's life. It was a really great time of freedom and to really be a normal married couple. The queen's able to go out shopping, she's able to go and get her hair done. There's a great candid photo of the queen from that period before she was queen dancing on a Navy ship. And she looks so carefree. She's sort of spinning around, her hair and her skirt flying behind her. And it's really a queen you do not usually see. While in Malta, Elizabeth became pregnant for the second time. And in August 1950, gave birth to Anne, the couple's only daughter. Following Philip's time in Malta, they returned to London and Clarence House had been renovated for them. And the Clarence House is a royal residence, but it's not 
like Windsor Castle or Buckingham Palace. It was a family home and they redecorated it. They made it their real first home. These years living in Clarence House as a normal nuclear family was a very precious time for them before she would become the queen and they would have to move to Buckingham Palace. It was clear to Elizabeth that because she was in line for the throne and her father, King George, had been ill with cancer for a long while, her life was going to change. In 1951, King George had his, one of his entire lungs removed, so they really knew that this magical time wasn't gonna last forever. That looming, there was the threat of King George's death and Elizabeth's ascension to the throne. <laughs> In The Crown, King George is played by Jared Harris. The 56-year-old actor is perhaps best known for his role as Lane Price on Mad Men. You and I are going to address that insult. Are you kidding me? No, you're a grimy little pimp. As soon as I raise my hands, I warn you, it shall be too late to run. Jared Harris really portrayed King George as a very empathetic figure, a very caring and kind figure. In case you're wondering, I haven't anything specific to say just wanted to spend time with you through the lens of the crown you could really tell that elizabeth had a great relationship with um, her father he did a great job at preparing her to be the queen of england in real life elizabeth adored her father she was very close with him um, she did feel a, a genuine kinship and affection and connection um, with him and that's something that she certainly has carried through um, all the way to the present day that sense of his um you know belief in her and also the the sense of family duty on february 6 1952 king george VI died of lung cancer he was 52 years old. Elizabeth was in Kenya when she received the news. The 25-year-old princess was now the Queen of England. I should be the one to tell her. <laughs> Pretty much exactly as it's depicted in The Crown, Elizabeth and Philip were doing a tour of the Commonwealth um, because at the time George wasn't well enough to do that. So she had already sort of started stepping into her father's shoes and she happened to be in this very remote location um, when they got the news of his death. Philip gave Elizabeth the news and from this moment forward they knew that their lives were never going to be the same again.
I'll escort her down from there. No, sir, if you don't mind, the Crown takes precedence. In 1952, Elizabeth and Philip were in Kenya. While they were there, they got the news that King George VI had died, um, making her the new queen. So really, when they came home, they came back to a totally different life um, and totally different expectations from the life that they left. So it was really like things changed in an instant for them. Elizabeth is adjusting to a massive change, which is she is now the queen and she's a young mother on top of that. So there are a lot of competing demands and a lot of shifting um, power balances um, within the marriage uh, between Elizabeth and Philip. There are decisions she's going to need to make as monarch that he might disagree with, um, that if you were a different type of couple, maybe you're gonna talk it out and compromise. She's now the queen. Immediately, Elizabeth and Philip have to move from Clarence House to Buckingham Palace. And straight away, Philip is realizing that his power and his influence and his decision making is waning and he's losing control of aspects of his life. Clarence House. Our home. What about it? In the show, we see Philip really object to making the move from Clarence House to Buckingham Palace. We have to give it up. The home of the Sovereign of the United Kingdom is Buckingham Palace. Says who? Me. This isn't something that um, either Philip or Elizabeth has ever publicly discussed, but you can imagine that this was a move that would have been tough for him. This is the first proper home I've ever had. knowing that he was going to a place that was a gigantic, drafty, not the cozy family home that maybe, you know, they had been able to craft for themselves in Clarence House, but also really in the public eye. They'd rather we didn't keep the name. Mountbatten. Who's they? Cabinet. It's none of their business. One of the first conflicts to arise once she's made queen is what the children will be named. Philip very much wanted his children to carry the name Mountbatten, as he did. The name has to be Windsor, for stability. The queen, acting on advice and request really from the government, had to keep the name Windsor, and they did. This was one of the biggest fights in Elizabeth and Philip's marriage. Philip was really rankled about this decision. He remarked that he was the only man in England whose children wouldn't be taking their father's name. What kind of marriage is this? What kind of family? You've taken my career from me, you've taken my home, you've taken my name. I thought we were in this together. Philip um, is very quickly seeing himself shoved in the background here and he doesn't know what his role is going to be. There's no um, textbook study for somebody being the prince, con prince consort and so he's struggling with being emasculated and not really knowing what he's going to have to do going forward. The Duke of Edinburgh comes to vow lifelong allegiance to his queen. On June 2nd, 1953, 16 months after the death of her father, Queen Elizabeth was officially crowned at Westminster Abbey. The coronation was televised for the first time ever and 20 million viewers tuned in. It's the first time that a world audience has seen this kind of ceremony and gets an insight into the workings of the British monarchy. No one does coronations like the British royal family. This is a very, um, you know, formal, opulent, steeped in history, extravagant ceremony that has so many layers of meaning and tradition. As the Archbishop of Canterbury confirms Elizabeth's sovereignty by placing on her head the six-pound King Edward's crown. The pomp and pageantry of the two-and-one-half-hour ceremony is witnessed by the Queen Mother and Prince Charles. One of the things that made Elizabeth's coronation so special is that she was so young. She was only 26 years old, and it, it's not often that you see such a, a, a beautiful, glamorous young woman uh, ascend the throne the way that she did. You know, it was pure spectacle as well as great grand tradition, kind of all coming together in this one massive event. With becoming dignity, the Queen walked from the chair of estate to a place near King Edward's chair, 
preparatory to the ceremony of recognition. She was certainly very poised that day, very calm, collected, um, as she really always is in these kinds of situations. But she rose to the occasion um, and fulfilled her destiny. I have in sincerity pledged myself to your service as so many of you are pledged to mine. One of the lovely details about her coronation was in her radio dress, the queen mentions her husband. In this resolve, I have my husband to support me. He shares all my ideals and all my affection for you. It was a lovely mention for him. It's sort of, you know, if you win an Oscar, you mention your spouse, and this is a, that on a much grander scale is just another example of how she was very sensitive to share the spotlight with him when it was appropriate to do so. Take a worm. What? A worm with your fingers. Go on. They won't bite the worms, boy. That's it. Good boy. It's wriggling. Of course it's wriggling. It's a worm. It'll stop wriggling once you put it on the hook. Throughout the 1950s, Elizabeth remained busy with her royal duties, while Philip reigned supreme over the couple's home life. Within their real life, Philip was really in control of the family decisions and everything going on within the family. He really wore the trousers. Philip was very insistent on Charles's education be similar to his and that he would go to private school and go to Gordonston. This was actually in contrast to what the Queen Mum wanted for Charles. Gordonston is a much more brutal environment for education. It's quite a stern place. And the Queen Mother didn't really feel this suited Charles's personality as he was a lot more sensitive and not ready for this. Elizabeth stood by Philip's decision because she had decided early on that Philip would control a lot of the family's decisions. What we've since learned is that Charles did not really enjoy boarding school. And as he grew up and started to talk about his upbringing, he had some harsh words for those years. In the past, Charles has really spoken out about how he didn't love boarding school and he felt that his parents were sort of detached and not very present in his life when he was a child. But he's kind of changed his tune a bit and said that his, he does have happy memories of his childhood and has a good relationship with his parents. I think it's very fair to say that they were loving parents, but they were loving in a very different way to today's judgments of parents. They weren't very cosy, they weren't very lovey-dovey. There was a big love there, but it was very distant. There wouldn't be any second thoughts about leaving the children on their own and not necessarily seeing them. In the same tense of the time, when they did see them, they did have fun. There was a lot of laughter in the halls of Buckingham Palace. They did play games. They were happy children. In 1956, Philip left London and his family behind to embark on a four-month trip around the world. He was gone for an extended period of time, and it raised some eyebrows among the press and royal watchers. They had spent Christmas apart, which would be a very big deal in England. There was rumours, in fact, that he was unfaithful to um, Elizabeth, but these have never been confirmed. The palace took the unusual step of issuing the denial. It is untrue that there is any rift between the Queen and the Duke. When Philip returned from sea, there was a very authentic joy between Elizabeth and Philip, which was very publicly displayed, and it dispelled these rumours. The first season of The Crown ends in 1956, before Philip set sail. But the show does deal with the whispers of infidelity. I have nothing to hide from you. Nothing. One of the things uh, that makes the crown very intriguing is this hint that there could have been infidelity in the marriage. But to everyone's regret and frustration, the only person I have ever loved is you. And can you honestly look me in the eye and say the same? 
does make for good drama, but when we look at the real life situation, there are rumors, there have always been rumors, but no evidence that either of them ever cheated on the other. Before ending their vacation at Balmoral Castle, the British royal family foregather on the lawn of their Scottish Highlands retreat to allow Movietone a rare opportunity to film them all together. Baby Prince Andrew stealing the show. In 1960, the royal family hit a milestone when Prince Andrew was born. That made him the first child born to a monarch since 1857 with Queen Victoria. And then a few years later, in 1964, their fourth and final child, Prince Edward, was born. Many historians say that Queen Elizabeth had her first family and her second family, and that she regretted not spending as much time with her older children as she could have. And so when she had Andrew and Edward, her younger kids, she made up for lost time with them. Although she was still very much always responsible in terms of her duty, she wanted to make sure she had more time to be a mom. Around this time, a playwright described the monarchy as a gold tooth in a mouthful of decay. Basically, that they were being ostentatious in a time of austerity. It was from the playwright John Osborne, who was critical of the monarchy, a very famous quote that obviously got under the royal family's skin. And they responded in 1969 by allowing themselves to be filmed for a documentary where you saw them doing normal things. You see them on a picnic and sitting down to dinner and talking as a family. Extremely difficult sometimes to keep a straight uh, face. When <laughs> the Home Secretary <laughs> said to me, uh, there's, a, there's a gorilla coming in. So I said, you know, what an extraordinary remark to make, very unkind about anybody. And uh, so, you know, I stood in the middle of the room and pressed the bell and the doors opened, and there was a gorilla. <laughs> At this point, Andrew um, and Edward are still younger, but Charles and Anne are, you know, pretty much young adults. And so there was some talk that they resented the intrusion. Um, it was almost like a reality TV show before that was a thing. And it was certainly something the royal family really rarely, and if ever, does. Despite the children looking back and saying they felt it was intrusive, the film at the time really had the desired effect, which was to humanize the monarchy for their subjects. People who watched it in 1969 looked and said, the queen is just like me. She, you know, takes things out of a picnic basket and feeds her family and plays with the dogs. It was, um, it was sort of delightful. all I want. Thank you. I want to thank all those in Britain and the Commonwealth who through their loyalty and friendship have given me strength and encouragement during these last 25 years. In the 70s, we see Great Britain go through a time of political and economic turmoil. And this is where we really start to see the Queen rise above as a figure who is apolitical, outside of debates about economics or elections. She is starting to emerge as a kind of constant for her subjects in Great Britain. Meanwhile, Elizabeth and Philip's firstborn was making more and more headlines. After much speculation throughout the 70s about who Prince Charles would marry and who would be the future queen, Charles uh, married Diana Spencer in 1981. Here is the stuff of which fairy tales are made. The prince and princess on their wedding day. The queen and Philip were very happy with Charles' choice of Diana, who was from an aristocratic family, who they knew very well, and she was seen as perfect material for this role. Hi, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. The wedding of Charles and Diana is a massive spectacle on a truly global scale, even though the same was true at the time of Philip and Elizabeth's Things have changed, so now we have an audience of 750 million people 
watching it live on television and at this point you know most people have televisions in their homes so it's really a different world the wedding of prince charles and diana in 1981 was watched by millions of people but probably not enjoyed by anyone more than his parents philip and elizabeth who by all accounts spent the entire evening dancing And then the year after Charles and Diana got married, she gave birth to their first son, Prince William, giving them the heir and, you know, really cementing the monarchy for a future generation. And then soon after, she gave birth to Prince Harry, giving them the heir and the spare, so really even further securing the monarchy and securing the royal family's place in history. William is someone that she takes a special interest in he is the direct heir behind Charles, and Queen Elizabeth takes him under her wing to mentor him. As he starts to become a teenager, she brings him to Windsor Castle on Sundays, where he gets to see firsthand the job in action. He's called her, you know, the greatest teacher. Nineteen ninety-two is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. The most difficult time of um, Philip and Elizabeth's life would have been 1992, which she in fact described as her annus horribilis in her Queen's speech at Christmas time. The Annus Horribilis is a Latin term that the Queen used to describe a very bad year. And she wasn't being dramatic. It was a year that saw two splits, Charles and Diana, Andrew and Fergie, the divorce finalized between Anne and her first husband, and then it was capped off with a fire that destroyed a portion of Windsor Castle. I sometimes wonder how future generations will judge the events of this tumultuous year. I dare say that history will take a slightly more moderate view than that of some contemporary commentators. He who has never failed to reach perfection has a right to be the harshest critic. Prince Charles and Princess Diana's separation is a period of tremendous pain for the royal family and in particular for Queen Elizabeth because this is her firstborn child and marriage is extremely important and sacred to Elizabeth. So first she finds out that this marriage isn't working. Next, Princess Diana goes on television and Prince Charles also, and each give interviews talking about their own infidelities. And in Charles's case, he admits that he cheated on Diana with his longtime love, who he would later marry, Camilla Parker Bowles. And in Diana's case, she famously says, Well, there were three of us in this marriage. So it was a bit crowded. <laughs> and for the queen, Diana's interview is really the final straw because she feels that this public war of words cannot continue to play out in the spotlight, that it needs to be over. So um, many people um, in royal circles say that it was after Diana's interview, the queen intervened and said, it's over, you two need to call it quits and move on because this is not working anymore. Charles and Diana's divorce was finalized in 1996. The following year, Elizabeth and Philip were forced to mourn the sudden and tragic death of the People's Princess. Confirmation from Buckingham Palace tonight that the world has lost uh, Princess Diana at age 36, a dead in a car crash in Paris along with her companion of the past several weeks, Dodi El Fayed, uh, one of the heirs to the Harrods uh, uh, department store fortune. The Queen's reaction was criticized really around the world, especially, however, among the people of the United Kingdom who were really grieving in their own way for this beloved princess. She was, at this point, her son's ex-wife. She was also the mother of two of her grandchildren. And she was a figure whose own fame had really outstripped 
the queens in many ways. And certainly her popularity had become on another level from anything the world had ever seen before. So that was that was a lot, there were, there were a lot of layers for the queen to navigate after Diana's death. The queen remained at Thalmoral, the Scottish estate where she and Charles and William and Harry had been when they learned of Diana's death. And many felt that she needed to return to London and acknowledge the tragedy. The city of London was in this sort of collective mourning and grief. And the days went by where Elizabeth was still not there, not there, not there. I think it's disgusting that they have not appeared or said a word relating to all this. I really am upset. I can't understand the Queen doing it, really. People were looking to her to be this grandmother, mother figure for the nation. And by her absence, they felt that she was misjudging the nation's need to be reassured by her. So ultimately, she came to London and she gave this sort of famous address um, on television. What I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. It was, you know, a, a very difficult thing for the Queen to do. It was certainly an unconventional thing for her to do. In her mind, this was not her role, but ultimately she fulfilled it. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. She, you know, received her fair share of criticism for the choices she made, but ultimately was sort of redeemed, at least to an extent, in the public's eye by her speech. I hope that tomorrow we can all, wherever we are, join, join in, in expressing, expressing our, our grief, grief at Diana's, Diana's loss and gratitude for her all too short life. May those who died rest in peace, and may we, each and every one of us, Thank God for someone who made many, many people happy. This situation was portrayed very evocatively in the film The Queen, which was put together by Peter Morgan, who actually created The Crown too. I don't think I shall ever understand what happened this summer. Well, the circumstances were exceptional, ma'am. And in the end, you showed great personal strength courage and humility. You're confusing humility with humiliation. Peter Morgan has really made a career of portraying Elizabeth and the real personal side of Elizabeth, and that's exactly what he does to so well in The Crown. And you know, the, the producers of The Crown have said that their hope is to go all the way through with the Queen's life through the modern day, so eventually we, we will see this play out in The Crown. It is a chance to show to the whole world the British nation united in grief and respect. And bad, she never lost her capacity to smile.
through his life through the day. In 2011, Elizabeth and Philip celebrated the marriage of their grandson, William, the future king, to Catherine Middleton, a commoner from the village of Bucklebury. William's marriage was a pretty significant break from tradition for the royal family. This was the first time that a direct heir to the throne had married someone who is not an aristocrat, not from a noble family. In fact, Kate's parents had once worked as airline stewards and they're self-made entrepreneurs who built a business from scratch. They got in early on e-commerce and built up a party planning business online. And so Kate is not from a family that would have historically been considered suitable for marrying into the royals. In the 70s, when Prince Charles was looking for a wife, there was very strict guidelines about who could be um, a princess and whether they would have to be a virgin, whether they would have to come to this particular family. And the Queen really lessened those restrictions and has advocated for Prince Harry and for Prince William to, to basically follow their own hearts and to choose who they want to marry. We're watching for an engagement announcement from Prince Harry, who has been dating the American actress Meghan Markle, and she could be the next princess. There is so much about Meghan that would make her a completely different kind of royal bride should Harry propose. She's American, for starters. She's an actress. She's very independent. She has um, a biracial background. She's very you know, proud of her mixed race heritage and has spoken about that in the past. And she's divorced. So all of those factors are really something that half a century ago would have been unheard of for someone considered a candidate to marry into the royal family. The other news we're following is the pregnancy of Princess Kate with her third child. That will make for Philip and Elizabeth a sixth great-grandchild, and I'm sure they're very excited, as we all are. Elizabeth made history on April 21st, 2016, when she became the first British monarch to celebrate her 90th birthday. And it's not the only milestone Elizabeth has set. She is also the longest reigning British monarch in history. She's now reigned 65 years, which is a really remarkable achievement, um, un unparalleled. As a queen in her 90s, she still maintains a really active schedule. And while she has handed off some of her royal duties to her children and to her grandchildren, she's still really busy. In the summer of 2016, Philip actually retired from royal duties. I'm sorry for you standing down. I can't stand up much. He was the longest serving consort to the monarch that has ever happened. I think he did 22,000 royal engagements, thousands of speech, and he did a lot of good. Over 70 years, their love has endured and stayed really strong, and members of their family have said that Prince Philip is really the pillar of strength that has kept Queen Elizabeth going and kept her grounded throughout her, you know, 65-year reign. A really remarkable thing about Elizabeth's reign is that in the 65 years she's been on the throne. She and Philip too have met basically every major world leader of the 20th and into the 21st century. It's really astonishing and kind of mind boggling when you think about it. Stalin and Truman were in power when she ascended. Nixon and the Kennedys, the Obamas, um, you know, all the way through, plus, of course, all the British prime ministers. She has been a true witness to history. I am aware that I'm surrounded by people who feel that they could do the job better. Strong people with powerful characters, more natural leaders, perhaps better suited to leading from the front, making a mark. But for better or worse, the crown has landed on my head. 
So the big question when everybody watched The Crown was like, what does the Queen think? And it's been reported that she has watched the show. She actually loves soap operas and that she gave her royal seal of approval and that she likes the portrayal of her and Philip's relationship. 